uh, spiritual knowledge. That was the first one, the first purpose. Uh, the Buddha Bhavana is the best example of that because uh, he's actually doing that. It's very hard to uh, assimilate and to learn everything, to digest and to realize, and then to present it systematically to others to be able to understand it. And he is also my very big inspiration in that um, first purpose of ISKCON. So uh, we are going to have today uh, to hear from him the next six purposes. So I would like to uh, invite him kindly to show us what he comes in front and that he can continue. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. We'll again say Mangal Acharyan and then we will um, we'll continue from um, tomorrow. Nagyanat Miranda Siagyananjana Shalakaya Chakshu Unamalitanyana Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Vishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Upagadam Ayam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yuta Padakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavam Ticha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Zahagana Ragmatam Vatam Tom Sajivu Sadvaitam Savadutam Virginia Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakam Vatamscha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namastata Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrindavaneshri Rishabhanu Sutta Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vanchakavatrabhyas Cha Kripa Sindhu Vyeva Chapatitanam Bhavane Vyo Vaishnava Vyo Namo Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Ravanityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadara, Sri Vasudhi, Gaura Bhattavinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Hare, Hare Hare. So, again, offering my obeisances to um, all of you, especially so in this Chandramali March. So, again, begging your blessings and your um, permission and empowerment so we can speak something today. I have a, I'll apologize up front, I have a tendency to <laughs> take a long time to talk about one thing. So I'll try and make sure that I don't expand um, <laughs> try and keep things in, line, <laughs> in time with the, um, with the time that we have together. But yeah, again, very, very interesting um, points to discuss can in I, terms of- Can I say? Yes. I just want to intervene just for a second. Um, I can only stay for the first hour and a half. I think you're on for two hours. So please excuse me after the first hour and a half, I have to depart, um, which I think is I'll just miss the questions and answers section. And then some, I think maybe a Lavanya or someone else can announce the rest of the afternoon pro program to make sure people are aware of two other events which are scheduled for this afternoon. Yes, good morning. So uh, the IT presentation yes, and the morning. other, the last part of the whole seminar. So um, okay. it is, uh, should I announce now or later, good morning? You can announce it at the end, that's yes. fine. Thank you. I'm sorry, Bhutta Baba. No. I just I just wanted to make sure that was that'll go on. Okay. Not at all, Marge. Feel free to you know speak whenever you whenever you wish, please. Okay, thank I, you. I jump out of my role. Of, you know, I I try to I try to be the controller sometimes. <laughs> so no, it's a way to hear from you. Way to hear from you. Okay, very good. Shit. So um, so yeah, we'll. We'll cover the other six today, so I'll just get straight into it. And, and again, as we go through, we'd like you to, to make notes, and, and I'll explain one of the values of making notes as we go through these six, but just remember to make notes, and also to think about these principles in relation to your own spiritual life, okay? Because again, it will come back to application. The more that we take the teachings, the more that we apply it within our own lives, the more that the teachings become very real they become a very integral part of 
who we are as individuals and the easier it is for us to develop faith. Because when you apply something properly, it, it achieves certain outcomes and the outcomes are both internal and external. And what that does is then we get even more conviction by direct experience, wow, this stuff actually works. I read this in the Bhagavatam, I apply this in my life, and I'm seeing for myself that it actually has a tangible effect. And that big builds the faith even more. And in one sense, Shraddha to Prema is just an intensification and purification of faith. As the faith builds, we come to higher and higher levels. Okay, so the second principle, sorry, the second, the second of the seven purposes is to propagate a consciousness of Krishna as he is revealed in Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. So for this, I wanted to read you something. And this is from, this is from the Chaitanya Charitamrita. This is Madhya chapter 20, text number 151. Okay, so I'll just read this and then we can take it a step further. Okay, so this, I'll just go into the, uh, actually I'll read, I'll read this Sanskrit. Dashame Dashamam Lakshyam Ashritas Raya Vigraham Shri Krishnakyam Param Dharma Jagat Dharma Namami Tat. Okay, translation and purple by his divine grace, Shila AC Bhaktivedanta Swami Shila Prabhupada Shila Prabhupada Ki Chai. Prabhupada writes The tenth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam reveals the tenth top, um, the tenth object, the supreme personality of Godhead who is the shelter of all surrendered souls. He is known as Sri Krishna and he is the ultimate source of all the universes. Let me offer my obeisances unto him. Purple, you may just read, actually we'll read all of it. This is a quotation from the Bhavata Dipika, Sridhar Swami's commentary on Srimad Bhagavatam 10.1.1. In the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, there is a description of the Ashraya Tattva, Sri Krishna. There are two tattvas, Ashraya Tattva and Ashrita Tattva. Ashraya Tattva is the objective and Ashrita Tattva is the subjective. Since the lotus feet of Lord Sri Krishna are the shelter of all devotees, Sri Krishna is called Param Dharma. In the Bhagavad Gita 10.12, it is stated Param Brahma Param Dharma Pavitram Paramam Bhavan. Everything is resting under the lotus feet of Krishna. In Srimad Bhagavatam 10, 14, 58, it is stated, Samasrita ye pada palava plavam, mahat padam punya yasho murare. Under the lotus feet of Sri Krishna, the entire mahat tattva is existing. Since everything is under Sri Krishna's protection, Sri Krishna is called Ashraya Tattva. Everything else is called Ashrita Tattva. The material creation is also called Ashrita Tattva. Liberation from material bondage and the attainment of the spiritual platform are also Ashrita Tattva. Krishna is the only Ashraya Tattva. In the beginning of the creation, there are Mahavishnu, Garbhadakshaya Vishnu and Shiradakshaya Vishnu. They are also Ashraya Tattva. Krishna is the cause of all causes, sarva karana karanam. To understand Krishna perfectly, one has to make an analytical study of Ashraya Tattva and Ashrita Tattva. So this is very interesting for a number of reasons. We touched upon this yesterday that in the Bhagavatam there are 10 topics. Um, let's see, Saga, Vishaga, Stanam, Poshanam, uh, let's see, Stanam, Poshanam, Uti, uh, Manvanta, Ishanukata, Niroda, Mukti, and Ashraya. Ashraya is a tenth topic. All the other topics should be seen in line with this Ashraya, the tenth topic. And actually the goal of Bhagavatam is really to help everyone to understand Ashraya. The goal of Bhagavatam is to help everyone to understand Etev Chamsab Kalaupum Sa Krishna Stu Bhagavan Swam, that there are many incarnations of Krishna. There are many incarnations of God. Two. Two means but. But Krishna isn't an incarnation. Uh, 
is the original form, uh, the original form, the first, the everlasting original form of the Lord. And so Prabhupada in this second, pur um, second purpose to propagate a consciousness of Krishna as he is revealed in the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, this itself is, is, a, is a major, a major point. In, um, it is in the Tattvasandhava of Jiva Goswami. He goes to great lengths to really establish this particular point. So what he does in his Tattvasandhava is he'll speak about many different points, but he's especially explaining, for example, Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, chapter two, text number 11. Um, let's see. Brahmati Paramatmati Bhagavaniti Shabyate. So he's explaining, first of all, he's helping people to understand there is an impersonal Brahman, more so there is a Paramatma, more so there is Bhagavan. But then beyond that, he takes it through to really establish that of all the different incarnations of God, Krishna is the original incarnation of God. And also that Srimad Bhagavatam is the highest Praman. It is the highest source of evidence. And so this understanding, this first canto, chapter three, text number 28, as we touched upon this yesterday, is this Paribhas Sutra. Paribhas Sutra means emperor verse. It is actually the, the lens, or let's say the verse through which all the other verses in the Bhagavatam are meant to be understood, right? And literally every Vedic literature, it has both a Paribhas Sutra, so an emperor verse through which you understand all the others, and they generally have what we call a Mahavakya or a great statement. So both things are actually there. So with Paribhas Sutra, it gives us the entrance point because without this, it's easy to misunderstand because in the Bhagavatam, you'll hear about many incarnations. You'll hear about Vamanadev, we'll hear about you know, Kapila Muni, Prithu Maharaj, there's so many different forms of the Lord, Shiradakshaya Vishnu, Mahavishnu, etc. But they're not all considered in the same way that Krishna is. And it's also very interesting for us because as Gaudiya Vaishnavas, our goal is actually Braj Bhakti. Our goal is Krishna in Vrindavan. There's even the purple in the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> and it's so interesting where Prabhupada, is, he's really making this point that we should focus on Shamsunda Krishna. And one should not even be distracted by other forms of the Lord. Right? Prabhupada explicitly states this. So in these two literatures in particular, though Prabhupada has written so much, he's establishing this point. Yes, many incarnations, many incarnations, but in our line, in our Gaudiya Vaishnava line, in the line of Prabhupada, in the line of the Goswamis, who are intimate associates of the Supreme Personality of God in Vrindavan. In their line, what we are understanding, what we're focusing on is this, original form of the Lord, Shamasunda Krishna, in his, in his complete, in his, in his fullest expression. Fullest expression means it goes beyond the Aishvarya. So different dharms have different, uh, different dharms have a different predominating opulence. So for example, in the, in, in Vrindavan is Madhurya. The opulence of sweetness, that is foremost. In, uh, let's see, in Mayapur is Odarya, that mood of magnanimity, compassion. Um, in Jagannath Puri, it's Aishvarya, yeah, that ma majesty in that sense. So all of them are present even in Vrindavan, but one is predominant. So in Vrindavan, you have Aishvarya, there is opulence. You have Odarya, there's magnanimity, but the Madhurya is predominant. It is the primary of all those different flavors, although all exist even in Vrindavan. So this is what Prabhupada is giving in this second purple, to propagate the consciousness of Krishna. And if we think about how this translates to us, there's a couple of things that we can consider. One is how well we are entering into this teaching of Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. That's one thing we can consider in our own personal lives. How well am I really regularly reading and reflecting and applying the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita and the Srimad Bhagavatam? You know, in the Bhagavatam, it says itself, Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya. Huh? It's very interesting, Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya, regular. 
regular hearing of the Bhagavatam, serving the book Bhagavat and the person Bhagavat. What is the effect that that has? The Bhagavatam also explains that effect. Almost everything troublesome to the heart is destroyed. Uh, so our Acharyas explain that by these two processes, one comes to Nishta. Regular service to the book Bhagavat and to the person Bhagavat. Uh, at Nishta, 75% of the Anatas are destroyed. That is explained by Vishnav Chakravali Thakur in the Madhuri Kadambini. And it is also explained that from Nishta onwards, it is like an elevator. So progress is able to be much faster because a, a serious amount of the purification has taken place, a significant amount of the purification. So these are the formulas given. And it's centered, or the central teaching in the, in the Bhagavatam is this awareness of Krishna. So how much am I aware of the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita, Shrimad Bhagavatam? How regularly am I connecting with these teachings? How regularly do I put them into practice? And then you could actually take one more, put one more understanding from this, because it says to propagate the consciousness of Krishna as he is revealed in the Bhagavad Gita and Shrimad Bhagavatam, a consciousness of Krishna. Prabhupada says in one place to know Krishna is to love him. So we can also ask ourselves the question, how much do I actually, how much am I really understanding who Krishna is as a person? He's Nama, Rupa, Guna, Leela. How much am I understanding? Prabhupada has beautifully given that understanding, knowing that his time was, you know, limited. Krishna book. Krishna book is a summary study of the 10th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. It is, it is Krishna's pastimes, Krishna Kata. So with everything that we're doing in our daily lives, so many other responsibilities we may have, this propagation of the consciousness of Krishna, who he is, you know, how he, how he deals with his devotees, all of these things are in the Bhagavatam and in the Bhagavad Gita, they've been given by Prabhupada. And if we, if we do this also, this regular reading of Prabhupada's books in this way, it will, what, what does the Bhagavatam say? It says by this, by this process, the Lord actually becomes, he actually enters into the heart of the living entity. So the Lord will actually enter into and reside within the heart of such a devotee. So again, application. We have so much philosophy, but, but there's a science to sadhana. Sad dana. Sad eternal, dan means wealth. There's a science to how to how to gain this eternal wealth. And that is nityam bhagavata sevaya. Not just bhagavata sevaya, nityam, regular bhagavatam seva to the person and also to the book. And what that does is it builds up. Just like in business, you want to make a profit, you can't do business every now and then. You do it regularly. You do business regularly. You, you, you serve regularly, you sell your products regularly, things build up and they build up in a very special way. They build up in an exponential way, okay? Because they build upon each other. We've, we've, I, was giving, um, I was giving a class, it was on leadership. So we were speaking about Bishandev's instructions to Yudhisthira and it was to a group of professionals. And we were talking about how if you hear something and you hear sporadically, then you hear it, you have some impression of the knowledge. Because it's sporadic, you forget a lot of it. Then when you hear again, it's harder to really take value from that knowledge. Why? Because you have to relearn what you've forgotten already. One of the special qualities of this Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya is that when you hear, and then you hear again soon after, you build upon your previous level of hearing. And in that process, you also reinforce and deepen what you already know. And funnily enough, you do another thing. You, you make it easier to learn more. Because when you learn something new, you can connect it to what you previously understand. So it becomes actually easier. And this is also part of our process of transformation. Um, there was a statement by Prabhupada, it's incredible actually, He's, let me see if I can find it for you, because it was a point that he was making to the devotees 
about the mind and about the, the nature of our minds in Kali Yuga, which is restless. I'll just see if I can find it. Here he is. So this is a statement made by Prabhupada. It was a lecture that he gave on the Srimad Bhagavatam, second canto, chapter nine, text number 14 in Melbourne on April the 13th, 1972. And he says this, and, and before I just read you what he says, just think about this point in the modern world and so much disturbance, especially mental disturbance. And then listen to what Prabhupada says here. He says, you are restless because you don't read. I'm laboring so hard for you, but you don't take advantage. Don't take advantage of eating and sleeping. Take advantage of these books. Then your life will be successful. My duty, I have given you so valuable things, day and night, trying to convince you, each word to word. And if you don't take advantage of this, then what can I do for you? It's very interesting. If you look again at this, this, the words that Prabhupada uses, for example, restless. Restless means rajas. You are restless because you don't read. What, what, is, what, is, what is implied by reading, and the Bhagavatam also talks about this, one becomes situated in unalloyed happiness, unalloyed goodness. So what that means is these things which are troublesome to the heart, the lower modes, and, and Bhagavatam says this also in the first canto, the modes of passion and the modes of ignorance, they'll be destroyed. So our issues come from these tamas, this ignorance, these lower modes, and the covering of our true identity as servants of the Lord. And this regular study has the ability to destroy those lower modes. To destroy those lower modes. That means to give us more than peace of mind. More than peace of mind. To give us actually a deep, eternal sense of connection to Krishna. In our full spiritual identity. So this is what's on offer. But it's a sadhana. It's a way of being. It's a way of living. It's a way of practicing. And it should be done regularly. So the, the only thing I'll just reinforce here, as your reflection, a practical reflection on the second purpose, is how much do I know Krishna? Right? As a person, what well, he's like, you know, Nama, Rupa, Guna, Leela, name, form, qualities, pastimes. Right? One question. Second, how much am I regularly in touch with the Bhagavad Gita and the Srimad Bhagavatam? And that regular connection is also a transformation that will appear within our hearts. Okay. I'll go on to the next point. To bring the members of the society together with each other and nearer to Krishna. And thus to develop the idea within the members and humanity at large that each soul is part and parcel of the supreme personality of Godhead. So identity is a huge thing. This point, to develop the idea that everyone is part and parcel of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Um, well, first of all, this is directly Shastra. Namai Bamso Jiva Loke. Jiva Bhuta Sanatana Manashishtan Indriyani Prakriti Shtani Kashati. Mama Eva Amsa. The living entities are my Amsa, part and parcel. Krishna's making that particular point. But, but there's, there's a lot more to this because we act according to our identity. In fact, even the decisions that we make in life are based upon our identity. So when you change someone's identity, you change everything. Because if my identity is different, then my decisions and choices will also be different and my outcomes in life will be different. So it's very interesting the wording used here. It's not just developing the idea within the members, but within humanity at large, Prabhupada says, that we're all part and parcel of Krishna. What happens when there's no, not one common nucleus is that you have inevitable conflict. And we see this in the world as well. If, if, we, if we just identify on the basis of race, on the basis of gender, on the basis of nationality, then you get this extended egoism. So it's my group and I'm trying to do what, what, what you know, what's going to be good for my group. I don't really care about your group. Now, that's also problematic because actually my own self-interest lies in within your well-being. What happens if I mistreat your particular group? Very simple. What, see, Krishna is so clever. And he's, he's so intelligent. 
what is karma? Karma is an exercise in empathy, right? So I, I see one particular group as the other. And therefore, I do not give you proper respect, dignity, and I treat you badly. The question then becomes, what is the best way to rectify my mentality? Very simple. The best way to rectify mental my mentality is to have me take birth in the very group that I've, uh, that I've mistreated. To be on the receiving end of exactly the same treatment that I've put out. And then it's no longer a theory that I shouldn't treat other people that way. I have a lived experience. I know what it's like to be on the receiving end. And what does that do? It neatly uproots that tendency within myself. An exercise in empathy. So the, so the material creation, it, it is a school. The material world is a school. But the special quality of the Bhagavatam and this point by Prabhupada is that if we, if we understand Krishna and we understand the teachings properly, you don't have to learn by experience, right? Experience is for the less intelligent. The teachings themselves will give us the understanding. And there's so much in the teachings. Again, if you just take third canto, some examples from the third canto, you have Diti and Kasyapa Muni, okay? So there are a couple, okay? Diti, unfortunately, she, she seduces her husband, right? She just wants to, she wants to enjoy. He's like, this is not the right time, but it does, she doesn't care. She just wants to enjoy. Who do they give birth to? They give birth to Hiranyaksha. Hiranyaksha means gold eyes, right? Golden eyes. It means one who just sees gold, gold everywhere. He's the personification of greed. So that's one example. You contrast that in the same third canto, Kardama Muni and Devahuti, she serves him. Rather than trying to enjoy him, she serves him. Who do they give birth to? Kapila Muni. So the Bhagavatam, you'll see constantly these different contrasts, different stories which have deeper meaning, deep, deeper purple. And the Summon Bonum, it all brings us ultimately to this idea, and we talked about this, Ashraya Tattva. The 10th topic, Krishna. And everything is meant to be understood in relation to that ultimate topic. Ultimate topic. So we are to come together to bring the members of the society together with each other and nearer to Krishna. That means you put Krishna in the center and we are around Krishna. We relate to each other in the way that the Supreme Personality of Godhead would be pleased. This idea of community is a big thing. I was trying to find this um, exact reference, but there was a study. They, they, they looked, there was a study, it was women, and they had some kind of tumor, but it was benign. Okay, so just try and under, just follow me on this. They had tumors, but they were benign. And they looked at what happened. So if the women had tumors, they were benign, and they were under stress. Okay, that wouldn't necessarily be enough for the tumor to become cancerous. Then you, they looked at another example, women who had tumors, but they felt alone, okay? That wouldn't be enough for the tumor, for the benign tumor to become cancerous. But when those women with the benign tumor were under stress and they felt alone, they felt no sense of relationship, those tumors were nine times more likely to become cancerous. What, is, what does that mean? It means that we are psychosocial spiritual beings. Our state of well being is intimately connected to our state of relationship. What happens, again, this, the study was talking about what happens when you're under stress. You can be under stress, but the moment that someone reaches out to you and says, Oh, you know, um, Prabhu, you seem a little bit under stress. Is everything okay? That they did some study on this your stress level immediately shoots down, immediately. Just by that sense of connection with someone who has your well, your best interests at heart. So relationship is intimately connected to well-being. Huh? Hence, six loving exchanges. Huh? 
That is what we're meant to apply in this society, bringing the members of the society together, not together to suffer, but together in such a way that we enhance each other and enhance and inspire each other on our journey to Krishna. So real community. Unfortunately, in the world, there's many communities and there's many places where people are just physically around each other. This is not what Prabhupada is speaking about. He's speaking about real spiritual community with Krishna in the center, where we deal with each other with the understanding that this person who I'm dealing with is part and parcel of the Lord. And we relate to each other in that understanding, with that understanding. So this is the third, the third, the third purpose that Prabhupada has outlined. What I would say here is in terms of application, just think about your friendships. Think about your relationships with the devotees. It is imperative that, that every one of us have, and I, I stress this, real relationships, real friendships in spiritual life. And, you know, again, feel free to correct me. It doesn't mean that you have to be close to everyone. I, I've actually, I remember hearing Chan Mui Marge, and I, I was very grateful for hearing this because unfortunately so few people speak about this. But Marge was talking about this principle of Swajati. Right? And this is in Bhagavatam, by the way, third canto, um, chapter 29, text number 17 in the purple. Prabhupada talks about association with those who are like minded. And he uses that, per that point there. He says Swajati. So, real friendships, people that you have a genuine connection to. Pe I, I remember hearing this in a seminar by Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj, he said that people who are in the modes of passion and ignorance, you don't have to be so close to them, but you should respect them. <laughs> you should respect still their devotees. But we should first, we should try to be the best association that we can be. And we should find, even within the community, find those people that we know have a genuine, are our genuine well-wishers. Those who are, who we can relate to and they can relate to us. A lot of our, it's so sad. I remember hearing from a devotee who was aspiring for Bhakti Rasamrita Maharaj in the past. And he told me that Maharaj had said that over 90% of his time is spent trying to deal with, with issues of devote, that devotees have in their relationships. 90%, can you believe that? 90%, I was shocked. But I guess in one sense, I shouldn't have been shocked. So this point, again, this like, touching upon this idea of application, because we have this impersonal idea that I will be close to everyone. You don't have time to be close to everyone. Most of us, you have full-time jobs, you have family, you have work. You don't have time to be close to every single person. We should respect all the devotees. We should be friendly with all the devotees, have a friendly mood. But the people that you have a close relationship with, those people, you should, you should, you should choose those relationships, those close intimate relationships wisely while still maintaining a mood of respect and friendship with everyone. Yeah? Because again, the idea that everyone is the same is impersonalism. That is not what the teachings of our, that's not the teachings of our, of our scripture. In fact, I remember reading a letter by Prabhupada. He said this idea that to expect all the devotees um, will be will behave well. He said, he said that's impersonalism. Prabhupada actually writes that in one letter as well. So we often have this misconception of what to expect in spiritual life. And then we, with the wrong understanding, we act in the wrong way. And then often we'll get our fingers burned. And again, what, what is the wrong conclusion? Oh, this Krishna consciousness stuff is too difficult. No, 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 actually often it's because we just don't apply it properly. We often have a sentimental application of the spiritual science. Actually, Prabhupada in one place, I think it's fifth canto, he, he, dis, he specifically talks about the scientific application of Krishna consciousness. If I can find the quote, I'll, I'll share it with you. So here we can think about this point. And I would say go a step further. When I first went to Mayapur year 2000, there was a seminar um, that I attended, strengthening our Vaishnav communities. And it's so interesting, the six loving exchanges, how often do we practice this? Are we conscious to practice this, revealing our mind in confidence? I've seen in my own life so many times when I've revealed my mind, and, and my, my spiritual master said this also, when you reveal your mind sincerely in good association, 
Krishna will often use that association to give us the answers that we need to move on. And what happens when we don't? What happens when we don't reveal our minds properly, especially when there's things which are troubling us, especially, then what happens is the mind becomes the guru. You know? We take shelter of our mind. So someone did something that you didn't like, but rather than revealing your mind, you think actually, I, you know, I, I already understand it, they're bad, etc. The mind becomes a guru. And then our response, it, it does not get any, any insight. It's only our material conditioning, our material ego. I've, I've, I'm gonna choose my own response to this person's behavior. There's no input, but I'm emotionally involved. And because I'm emotionally involved, I may not see that situation as clearly as someone else who's a friend. Friend, what does friend mean? They have their best, your best interests at heart, right? So they, they, they have your best interests at heart. They're also Krishna conscious. They're not gonna give you some material idea. They can help you to see this in light of what? Guru, Sadhu, Shastra. I, I can tell you from my own experience, so many times I've had one idea about how to proceed. But when I revealed my mind in association, the person gave me another few perspectives which I completely missed. I mean, I completely missed. I mean, I remember there's, there've been some times where I've received life, which is um, advice, which has literally just changed the entire course of my life. I remember speaking to one of my Shiksha gurus. There was some issue, and and I and I I didn't know I didn't even know I couldn't even see it clearly, but I thought I could. But luckily, I kind of revealed my mind to one of my Shiksha gurus, and they actually told me what was going on in my unconscious. Believe it or not, they said that what's happening with your mind is this, and this is what you should do. It was, it was incredible. Again, it literally just changed the entire paradigm. And I mean literally changed the entire paradigm. I mean, again, just to give a very, I remember we were in, I'm not sure if it was Croatia or Slovenia, and I was paying respects to Chandra Mouli Maharaj before we left, so I just came to say goodbye. And I asked Maharaj, I says, is there any last instruction for me? <laughs> and Maharaj told me, he told me about the, my nature. He said, Buddha Bhavna, you have this kind of nature. You need to find new ways to preach, right? And Maharaj spoke to me about, I'm not sure if Maharaj remembers, but he talked about, he gave the analogy of the, of the um, old wine in new bottles, right? The idea of you still give the same thing, but find new ways to present it. And he explained to me, he said, your nature, you need to do that. It's required for your kind of character. And it's true, and it, but I wasn't conscious of it. But when he said, it, I was like, oh yeah, yeah when, I'm, when I'm always kind of finding new and innovative ways to present Krishna consciousness, I'm completely enlivened. And if I have to do the same thing in the same way forever, it's just like, I'm just like, I just need to do something new, something new, something fresh, something different. So the association is key, okay? And that's what it means by community. If we don't have that, we don't really have community. We just have a group of people who have agreed to physically be around each other while they're all suffering. And unfortunately, we do have that also in, in many places in our movement. It's, it's unfortunate, but it's important for us to be that friend for someone else. And again, I stress this, it seems like a small thing, but this Swajati is very, very powerful. I was recently speaking to um, to some devotees who I've known for quite some years and they wanted to aspire you know for initiation and I was making the point you're looking for someone who's a bona fide spiritual master but also someone you can surrender to right so you can hear from and you can follow it's not just a question of oh Maharaj is very advanced yes he is but you also need to make sure that you can surrender to that spiritual master so really making that and looking properly doing things properly, connecting properly in relationship, and also getting to know the person, you know, having that period of aspiring where he tests you and you also test the spiritual master in the, in the proper way, in the respectful way, according to scripture. And by doing all of these things, the relationships are deeper, stronger, better, because now things are done in knowledge. Again, mode of goodness. You practice spiritual life in the mode of goodness so you can get to the transcendental platform. And we said, we said yesterday, Satvagun, maintenance, the ability to sustain has that quality. Therefore, when things are done in knowledge, you tend to find that they last. 
they last and they get sweeter and deeper and stronger. Whereas if we do things in the mode of ignorance, in the mode of passion, you can literally see the issues are coming, right? The most dangerous is the mode of passion actually, because the mode of passion, it looks good in the beginning. Ignorance looks bad and you can kind of see this looks bad. The difficulty with passion is it looks good in the beginning. So it looks like it's not a problem, but then in the long term, it becomes problematic. Anyway, so these are some reflections on this. So think about the loving exchanges. Think about your own relationships. Think about, do I have real friends in Krishna consciousness? And pe that means people who I can be honest with. There's also something very powerful when you have real friends, because real friends really help you to value yourself properly because they, their way of dealing with you is also a, an affirmation that you're important. Uh, it's an affirmation that you're valuable, an affirmation that, yes, we're all in this Krishna consciousness together. Sometimes we're in our spiritual life, we feel very enthusiastic and inspired. And therefore, your enthusiasm will spill over into the environment. Your enthusiasm actually also spills over into the ether. When you feel very spiritually enlivened and surcharged, your consciousness also drops that energy into the environment and people pick up on that. They can draw from it. The opposite is also true. If everyone's down, if everyone is, has no enthusiasm, if everyone's struggling, that lack of enthusiasm also enters into the ether, into the environment. And without knowing it, unconsciously, we also, unfortunately, then have to wash that lower energy off of ourselves. So we, wanted, we want to live in such a way that we can, how can I put this? I've seen over many years, when devotees are not well situated, you get into this stage in spiritual life where you're drowning. And, and then what happens is, so I'm drowning, and then I feel that the devotees aren't there for me, okay? But what's happening is, the devotees who I think should be there for me, they're also drowning. They're also drowning. I just see things externally. So I think, you know what, what you know, these devotees, we don't have any community. Devotees aren't there for each other, meaning that devotees aren't there for me. But what I can't see is that that same devotee behind the scenes, they're drowning as well. So again, and this links, I'll just jump because this links to point number six, to bring the members closer together for the purpose of teaching a simple and more natural way of life. If I live properly, then I have capacity to also help other people. Unfortunately, because we're sentimental, we think that I can live however I like, but there'll still be capacity. It doesn't work that way. If you live properly, then you also have capacity to help other people. But if you don't do things wisely, then you become the person who's drowning. And then when you reach out for other people and you find that they're also drowning, how are they gonna help us? So we can't be sentimental in spiritual life. There's a, there's a way to live, do it wisely. And Bhaktivinoda Notarko, he touches upon this. Look after yourself physically. Yes, you're not the body. That doesn't mean that you don't have a body. So look after yourself properly, physically. Why? In an understanding that the body belongs to Krishna, you're looking after Krishna's ve vehicle. Look after yourself mentally. And so in, in, the, in the study of scripture, in engaging according to our nature where possible, right? Engaging your spiritual life in a way that keeps you enthusiastic. Look after yourself emotionally. Have the proper relationships. If people are just draining your energy, <laughs> at, at work, we teach emotional intelligence to our managers. And we have this joke. We sometimes talk about people who you associate with and we call them the energy vampire. Right, the energy vampire people who just suck your energy. They just want to speak about nonsense. They're negative, all this kind of stuff. And you, and after you've been around them, you just feel drained. You just feel like, oh my god, I've just my mind, my mind feels just tired. Everything like that. There's no, there's no need to be foolish in spiritual life. It's a science. So engage wisely with the devotees. Yes, reveal your mind, but reveal your mind to devotees who are trustworthy. You see, the devotees who are trustworthy and who will also tell you the truth. I remember uh, I, asked, I asked my spiritual master this. This was in 2003 at Bhaktivedanta Manor. 
about friendship and association. And he said to me, he said, with a close friend, you should be able to say anything. That's what he told me. And you should also be ready to receive feedback from that close friend as well. So you can even reveal that you're struggling with something. You can, you know, even if you're upset with someone, it's fine to reveal it, that's healthy. We're honest about it. this is how I feel. It may or may not be the best, but I'm real. This is how I'm feeling. And then we can work with that together and bring it to a higher level. You know, the other thing that often happens is we don't know how to deal with, the, with our emotions. So therefore a devotee is upset about something. They just try and push this emotion down. They try to repress it. And that repressed emotion, if it's a negative emotion can often later on cause illness. Yeah. So again, we can, we can apply the Bhagavad Gita for three modes. Dealing with emotions, I deal with it in the mode of ignorance, so I neglect it or I repress it, not necessarily healthy. I deal with it in the mode of passion, so I just lash out at people, not healthy. Mode of goodness, I deal with my emotions in the mode of goodness. I acknowledge, I'm aware of my emotions. I acknowledge my emotions. I work with them to bring them in line with the teaching. But I start with the reality. This is how I'm feeling right now. I don't necessarily want to feel this way, but I'm upset. Something's happened. Okay. But we don't suppress it. We look at it. Okay. What, what is it that I'm, what can I do about this? What, 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 what was my role? I need to just get it out so I, I can speak to a confidential friend. So I express how I'm feeling and they're not going to judge me. Okay. And there's a difference between expressing your feelings and being offensive. Offensive is I insult the person. Expressing my feelings is this happened and I'm upset. I feel very angry. I feel I was there for this person in the past, etc., etc. So it's very honest. It's completely real, but it doesn't go into that space of criticism, you know, and I work with it. Okay. And that way I can keep on in spiritual life because oftentimes we, we, we have a misunderstanding. People may come because they hear the philosophy, but they stay because they see the philosophy in action in the lives of devotees, friendship, the relationships. And as we stay, we get purified. As we get purified, we become elevated. So it's a journey. So anyway, we've covered three and six. I'll also say some other point about this, bringing the members closer together for the purpose of teaching a simple and more natural way of life. That means goodness. From goodness to transcendence, it's much easier. There's a whole psychology around this. If, if people develop the mode of goodness, funny thing is, if, you develop, if we develop the mode of goodness, you become naturally more attracted to spiritual life. In the lower modes, it's more of a struggle. In goodness, spiritual life becomes more exciting. I was listening to this seminar on um, Shikshashtakam by um, Shri Ramraj, and he was, he was making this point, but he also made another point. He was talking about all the different stages. In Nishta, devotional service is predominantly in goodness. Same thing for Ruchi, same thing for Ashakti. At Bhava, devotional service is on the transcendental platform, and at Prema, it's on the transcendental platform. So he gives these delineations. So this simple and more natural way of life, the more that we are aligned with Sattva Gun for the purpose of transcendence. We're not trying to be a materialist in the mode of goodness. We're trying to practice devotional service from goodness upwards, okay? And this natural way of life really does help that purpose. So waking up early infuses the body with, and the mind with Sattva Gun. The mind is more stable. It's, it's so interesting. If you think about the modern world, you'll see people, you, I'm, I'm sure many of you have noticed, people become easily triggered. It's very easy for people to become triggered. That's not just to do with what's being said to them. A lot of it is to do with my own stability of mind. If my mind is already a little bit sensitive and then you say or do something that I don't like or that I read a certain way, I'll become very offended or very upset. It may not even be that you're intended to do that. But I was already in a very sensitive space, very fragile space, and now you've said or done something that's taken that already sensitive mind and I'm even more upset, I'm more disturbed. So that's actually a lot of what's going on in the modern world. And of course, it relates to so many other things. I'll just share with you something on this because 
I found this just really fascinating. So I'm just going to share with you. And this is actually, this I was, I was watching a few months ago, these memories of Prabhupada. And um, I came across, and this is online, this is on YouTube. This is Memories of Prabhupada, and, this, uh, and the lady's name is Kishori. She's on along with a few other people. So within the first few minutes, I think like from the sixth minute onwards in that particular Memories of Prabhupada, it's DVD number 77, and it's on YouTube. So she's talking about Prabhupada and what Prabhupada said about bringing up children, right? So he gave instructions on how children should be treated. And these instructions are also related to Ayurveda. And I'm just going to share one or two. Because if you see this, you'll also understand a lot about this idea of a simpler, more natural way of life. He said that children should never be left to cry. Now, he, he mentions that, especially when they're young. Now, I did some research on this because there are also psychologists who, who understand that the correlation between the childhood behaviors or the parenting of the child and what that leads to in the child as they become adults. So... This thing about letting the children cry themselves to sleep, that, that happens a lot in modern society and it's considered to be okay. But according to Ayurveda, that's not a good idea. Even according to, to some psychologists in the modern world who've done some research on this, the message that the child receives because between naught to five, their intelligence isn't developed. So everything that happens, they take it as a direct reflection on themselves. So the message that the child receives is that my emotions are not important. And that child often grows into the adult who has difficulty processing their own feelings. So Prabhupada said the child should never be left to cry. Another thing he says is, um, very interesting, he says never, never say no to the child, right? But he explains if the child is doing, this is when they're young, this is not from when all ages, right? When they're young. So we can watch the video and see it for yourself. But he also explains never say no to the child. So if the child's doing something that they shouldn't do, if they, if they have something that they shouldn't have, what you do is you put something else in their hand, you, you distract their attention with something else so you can take away the thing that they should not have. And he explains what happens to the child if you do this. He said, if you do this to the child, then as they grow up, they'll feel very confident later on. Interesting. So in the modern world where people are lacking in self-esteem, they're lacking in confidence, according to our teaching, it has a lot to do with the, with the parenting patterns when the child was young. But because it's a lost science, no one understands the connection. So there's a booming industry around mental Ill health, you know, learning to become confident, but they don't understand, as in our tradition, that it has a lot to do with these patterns when the child was young. So if there's a simpler, more natural way of life, then the people get attention. The young children get attention and they don't just get attention. They get attention from parents who are not stressed. Because if the parents are really stressed out, that child picks up that stress. And then when they're older, they're having to kind of recover from all of these different patterns that they received, even, even by well-intentioned well -intentioned parents. So there's a lot to it. I'll give you one more thing. And again, I, I encourage you to watch that. It's Memories of Prabhupada. Her name is Kishori. It's DVD 77, it's on YouTube. One other thing she says, it's very, it's so interesting. She says that with the child, it's very important that the child, that children should have toys. Prabhupada said this because, and he explains why, because when the child has toys, when they're young, then when they're older, the child will not have so much desire for big cars and other things. So it's a very interesting correlation. In many cases, the adults, are trying to make up for the things that they did not get in their childhood. Incredible. They're making, so, you know, I want to play with big toys. I want to have, the, you know, big cars, big mansion. Yeah, in many cases, that child didn't have sufficient play when they were young and they're acting out these unconscious patterns in their adult life. There was um, one study, I believe it was airplane pilots. When planes would crash, they have a black box. And what they do, is they, they will find out what happened, what, what was going on, what caused the plane to crash. And in many cases, when the, when the pilots who are often male, when they're about to die, who do they call out for, right? When, in our tradition, we, we want to develop our consciousness and so we call out for Krishna, right? Because antikale jamameva, smarmut vadkalevaram yaprayati samad bhavam, yati nashyasya samsayaha. What we think about at the time of death determines where we go. 
in the study, what they found is for most of these men at the time of death, just before they're about to die, they call out for mum. They're calling out for their mother because that's still what's going on behind the scenes in the consciousness. So this simpler, more natural way of life, there's a lot to it. There's a lot to it. And, and, and this is not to beat anyone up. It's really, we should be compassionate towards ourselves. Live in a way that, 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 that gives you time and space while also maintaining, right? And, and, and I know it's not easy. We're also working full time, all that. So do the best that you can. Do the best that you can. But, but understand that it's, it's also part of our journey to Krishna that we want to live in a way that we've got time. We've, it's not just time, actually. This is the trick of Maya. I, I actually, I was reflecting on this. There's three factors. It's time, it's energy, and it's also headspace. Because if you're too disturbed in life, you can't think. If people are too disturbed because life is so intense and everything is kind of piling on them, then what happens is they don't have peace of mind to really think and to practice Krishna consciousness with focus because the mind's always disturbed. So it's time, it's energy, and it's also mental capacity. Three things. And that correlates to this idea of a simple and more natural way of life. Simple living means you have more capacity for higher thinking. What happens in the, in the modern world is it's complex living and literally no thinking. And that's unfortunate because in the lower mode, if I don't have space to think, I will tend to do things in passion and ignorance. If I do things in passion and ignorance, I'll tend to create, my, to create other issues in my own life, which then expand then it becomes more work to deal with those other issues which have now expanded because I made a decision which wasn't well thought out. And it wasn't well thought out because I didn't take the time to think through, okay, this is an important decision. Let me think about this and do it wisely. So it becomes that kind of vicious spiral. Anyway, those are just some points on point number, that was point number six and point number three. So I'll go to point number four, um, actually no, I'll just say one more thing on point number six. So therefore, think about your own life. Um, I remember I got this advice also from my spiritual master. He said, at the end of the day, we should try to see how we can simplify, right? So just see, just think, just, and I'll leave you with that point. And, and not blindly, and I'm saying that, you know, you have to do it in a way that works for you. I'm not in your life, okay? For some, it could be sleeping early, rising early, right? For some, it could be getting the right balance between, you know, recharging or rejuvenating themselves when they when they finish their work they whatever it is but see where you can build your your life in such a way that you've got more time energy and mental capacity to focus in the krishna conscious direction okay i'll leave that with you in relation to point number six okay let's go to point number four Point number four is to teach and encourage the Sankirtan movement, congregational chanting of the holy name of God, and to reveal the teachings of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So, um, yeah, so Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, sometimes in the scriptures he's called Chana Avatar, Gupta Avatar, which means literally the hidden incarnation. But to, to be honest, it's, a, it's just... It's just quite unbelievable that we, in, in this lifetime, have even heard of this person. Even though there are literally millions of Hindus who are not familiar with Lord Chaitanya. And who is Lord Chaitanya? He is Krishna, but Radha Bhava Duti Suvalitam. He's Krishna with Radha Rani's mood and also complexion. Okay, But what is he giving? He's not just giving love of God. That's not, that's not technically accurate. He's giving love of Krishna in the wake of the residence of Vrindavan and specifically in the mood of the gopis, Ujjwalaras. So it's literally that in Kali Yuga, the most fallen age, we're being given opportunity to experience and to, to access the highest. It's, it's a complete contradiction. In previous ages, with more qualified personalities, they would generally go to Vaikuntha. 
generally. But we're not being given an opportunity to just go to Vaikuntha, we're being given an opportunity to go to Vrindavan and to engage in the exchanges with the Lord and his associates in the most intimate way. So it's, it's completely the opposite. It's like saying, okay, these people have no qualification whatsoever, but we're going to give them the highest opportunity. And technically, in relation to other processes, this process, not just, not just kirtan, sankirtan, emphasis on congregational chanting of the holy names, it is powerful for a number of reasons. We'll just give one or two. In the congregational chanting of the holy names, we are literally also gaining the blessings, the strength and the empowerment of the quality of everyone else's chanting. Everyone else is chanting. Prabhupada in his mission, he's literally given everything. The, the, the trends that you see in modern society, vegetarianism, veganism, environmentalism, yoga, kirtan, these would not be present in the world in the way that they are if not for Srila Prabhupada. So when you, when you think Prabhupada, you should think trendsetter. When you think Prabhupada, you should think game changer. Right? I remember many times visiting America and you know, in the yoga studios, I mean, and it's around the world, you have these yoga studios and they are into Kirtan. Right? They're really into Kirtan. And so even you know, some of our leaders, they go to these centers and along with people who are into yoga, they'll also do Kirtan, they'll give some philosophy because they're open. And this congregational chanting of the holy names, it does what? It not, it not only does it benefit the people who are in the kirtan, it actually benefits everyone because it is the yajna. Sankirtana praya yajanti hi sumedashaha. It is the yajna for the age. And nothing happens without sacrifice. When you see someone who has anything in this world and it seems that they got it without doing much work, it means that they did some austerity previously earlier in this life or in the previous life. Now, what is the austerity for this age? This is the austerity, the congregation of chanting of the holy names. It fulfills us on so many levels, huh? primarily spiritually, but people can connect with it from an aesthetic level. It sounds beautiful externally. People can connect to it from an emotional level. It is, it is a way for me to express my feelings. People can connect to it from a level of, of, of of connection on a human level in terms of relationships and bonding. I've often seen you go to a kirtan and you can tell the devotees who, who are close to each other because they do kirtan together and you can just see that you can see the, the, the mood between them. You can see that there's a certain resonance. Even they, they kind of, they, they tend to mirror each other's behavior even physically. And then, I, and then interestingly enough, I remember Tamal Krishnamaj also speaking about this. He told Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, as devotees, is often difficult for us to get along, right? How, you know, what can we do? He revealed his mind. And Prabhupada said that the, you, as devotees, you need an activity that you can all engage in together. Hmm? What is that activity? Harinam Sankirtan. If you do the, if you chant, if we engage in kirtan, real kirtan, and we do it in association with devotees, you see this bond that develops. Because what's happening is we're all coming together with Krishna in the center and we're all making a genuine real connection to Krishna. So what happens in the process is we're also bonding with each other through Krishna, through this shared activity. Even in business, they talk about how do you get teams to, to be effective? They have to have a shared sense of purpose. They have to have a shared sense of purpose, but, but not an artificial one. Not something that I, I don't really want to do it. It's got to be something that they all really get into. Now we can take it a step further. A shared sense of purpose that transforms the individual. A shared sense of purpose that elevates the individual. A shared sense of purpose that purifies the individual and removes the barriers that are causing the conflict in the first place. This is the yajna, Sankirtan yajna. This is the sacrifice. And without sacrifice, nothing works. It doesn't matter who you see. Anyone that you've seen with opulence, 
there's some yucky that's behind that. It is a prince. It is the principle of, of life and the principle of, of success, the principle of resources. There has to be some yucky in order to receive or achieve some type of outcome. So in the same way, the outcome that we're looking to achieve is achieved through this yagya. So for that, it is, it, is, it is important that we regularly do this, regularly chant and, and do this in congregation. Our japa should be done, must be done, absolutely. But it's also the case that we should do, we should engage in this Sankirtan Yagi, the congregational chanting of the holy names. I remember reading a translation of this prayer by Naratam Das Thakur, Hari Hari Bifale. And he explains, um, Golokira Primadana Harinam Sankirtan, and the translation. The treasure, so dun, dun means treasure. Golokera, huh? prema. The treasure of what? Goloka prem. Golokera prem. The treasure of divine love in Vrindavan has descended in the form of the congregational chanting of the holy names. So from the transcendental perspective, and Sri Ramaj mentions this in one of his books, um, there's a multi-volume set of books called Navavraja Mahima. And one of the books is just on the glories of the holy name. So he, he mentions this point. From the transcendental perspective, that chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra, it is actually prema. It is, it is, it is the prema of Vrindavan manifesting in the form of transcendental sound. And so our practice is to realize the original nature of the name. And that was Prabhupada's conviction. That's how he did everything, by the name, by the holy name of Krishna. So this is point number four, to teach and encourage the Sankirtan movement. And so there's many different levels of teaching and encouraging the Sankirtan movement. Engaging in congregational chanting, speaking about the holy name, worshiping the holy name, practicing the chanting, you know, anything that, that, that really glorifies the holy name in the activity of it and in the, in the tattva, the nam tattva, all of these things play into this. So it says to teach and encourage, to teach it and to encourage it. And of course, what's implicit here is that you also taste the name. You also have that connection. And as, you, as the name is alive in you, you can also help to make that name alive in other people as well. Okay. So that's number four. Um, all right, there's two more. How am I doing for time? Okay, we've got 20 minutes and then we'll open up for questions. So number five, to erect for the members and the society at large a holy place of transcendental pastimes dedicated to the personality of Godhead. So the Dharma is very, very powerful. Um, I, I think well, a hundred, a thousand times the benefit or a thousand, I think it's a thousand times the benefit. So service done in the Holy Dharm is a thousand times the benefit service done elsewhere. So Prabhupada wanted that his followers regularly make sure they visit the holy places. And of course, if we can go at, at the most auspicious times like, you know, Kartik, Gorpanim, then we get even more benefit. Purushottamas, you know, those types of times. But the point is, we should go. We should go and visit, if we can, regularly, you know, according to our means. And of course, we could also say we should make our own environments, literally those holy places as well. But there are also, I mean, I know that places like Gita Nagari, New Vraja Dham, they're also dams. Right? They're also holy places where, especially Govardhaniko villages also, so the whole place has been constructed in such a way that Krishna's pastime places are also present. But the point is, we should go into those environments in order to suffuse ourselves with spiritual energy, recharge ourselves and remember what the goal is. 
what, what is the aspiration of our Gaudiya line? What is the aspiration of the Gaudiya Vaishnavas? The aspiration is to serve the Lord in pure Braj Bhakti. That's what we want to serve the Lord, not just any form, not even just any form of Krishna, because there are different forms of Krishna, right? There's Krishna in Dwaraka, Krishna in Mathura, Krishna in Vrindavan. When Krishna is in Vrindavan, if you compare his body to when Krishna is in Dwarka, his body is slightly different. In Dwarka, his body is a little bit more Kshatriya-like. It's a bit more toned. In Vrindavan, his body is much more is soft, this kapha, because it's that, that, that particular manifestation, it correlates to that sweetness, that sweetness and that simplicity of Raj Bhakti where, you know what, I don't even care if he's God, he's Krishna, I love him, he's beautiful. So that very, very deep, sweet intimacy that we are, that we're blessed to have an opportunity to understand. And of course, when we go to the dams, it's so beautiful, we can, we can go on Parikram, we can hear about Krishna, we can see Krishna, we, we should increasingly feel at home. If the practice is proper, we should increasingly feel at home, oh, this is this is my Krishna's home, Lord, Ch Lord Chaitanya's home. And we go to visit those places where the Lord himself appeared and engaged in his, in his wonderful pastimes. And we associate with the residents of those pastimes. I was listening to a class this morning on Lord Chaitanya's travels. And um, the point was, it was made about the, the holy dharms and how that when people go to these dams, they, they actually offload their, uh, calm, their karma. So they actually offload their karma. So what happens to that karma? That karma is burnt up by the bhajan of those pure personalities. So in one sense, and this is alluded to in Chaitanya Charitamrita, wherever the pure devotee is, that place is also a dam. And um, actually there are different... I won't go into it now, but there are different types of dham. One's called Drishyamana dham. So there's like a, there's a material covering over the dham, right? So that's one type of dham. There's also, there's various different levels or types, but the point is we should be thankful for Prabhupada's erecting, he says erect for the members and the society at large. Very interesting. If you look at these purposes, because, because a pure devotee is, highly conscious nothing's whimsical because they're not affected by the lower modes so when they do and say things there's real precision and meaning to erect for the members and the society at large a holy place of transcendental pastimes dedicated to the personality of Godhead so we can recover and rejuvenate and strengthen and advance our spiritual life by the regular um visiting to these places especially if we do it in in the right mood so i mentioned yesterday this um adhikari tadva so in the exchanges in the bhagavatam especially the first canto you'll see how vyasadev relates to narada right very simple sincere mood of respect openness hearing inquiry you'll see how the sages of Naimad Saranya relate to Sutta Goswami. Again, asking questions very respectfully, wanting to hear. You'll see how Pariksit relates to, um, to um, Shukadev Goswami, right? They, they want to hear, there's a, there's a respectful mood. And the quality of those exchanges indicate the, the qualification of speaker and hearer necessary in order to receive what is, what is available. Again, in this class I was listening to this morning, a similar point was made. So. You have someone who is, who is very devotional, very deep in their devotion. Okay, wonderful. What do you receive from that person? What you receive is based upon your qualification. So qualification of the speaker and qualification of the hearer. Often what happens is we, we talk about everyone else's qualification and we, and we neglect our own qualification. The, the emphasis in our line is on our qualification. Because if we're receptive, that means properly receptive, humble, respectful, then you can gain from everyone. So two things, shushruta, 
very eager to hear and kriti be here, respectful, simple, simple hearted. So if we have these two qualities, Shushruta, I really want to understand, I want to learn, I want to grow. And I'm respectful in the association of Vaishnavas, especially advanced devotees, especially, but everyone, but especially advanced devotees. Then the nectar flows. Then whatever blessings that they have will, will enter into your own heart. This is a subtle science. Well, so it's not just, oh, how advanced they are. It's how receptive am I? And that receptivity is a cultivation of the heart that takes place in our day-to-day -day lives. So that's the point. And of course, if we practice that in our day-to-day -day lives, not only do we get the maximum blessings of everyone, because let's be honest, most and many people when Prabhupada appeared on the planet, they would not have known Prabhupada's quality. They would not have known who Prabhupada was because it's not obvious. He, he, Prabhupada, he's not even the person that many of us think that he is. One of my mentees is studying um, Jyotish. So he was looking at Prabhupada's chart and he told me, and he said, this was a few months ago, he said to me, he said, Buddha Bhavna, when you look at Prabhupada's chart, Prabhupada is just a very soft, very gentle, very kind person. He's just, that's just his nature. And, and I believed him. And then Krishna confirmed it in a, in a different way. So I believed him and I thought, yeah, that makes sense, right? Prabhupada, he acts as a Acharya, he's got a certain external stance, but he's just a very soft, very sweet, loving person. Then, as I was looking at these memories of Prabhupada, and again, I'd encourage you to look at this one as well. It's incredible. It's Ishan Prabhu, I-S-H-N, right? Memories of Prabhupada, part one. It's about an hour and a half long. And he's recalling a pastime with Prabhupada. And Prabhupada, he revealed exactly the same thing that my mentee saw in Prabhupada's chart. Prabhupada said, he said, I'm just a very simple person, really. He said, but if I did not act this way, you know, that kind of, you know, you see Prabhupada walking this strong acharya. He said, if I did not act this way, who would hear my message? Prabhupada told Ishan Prabhu that on a morning walk. He's very intelligent. He, he had understood the mentality of people in the West and also to be honest, everyone in the modern age. That if you externally act just very humble and timid, they think you're weak and they'll try and push you around. So what he does as the Acharya, he knows, I need to lead these people. What, and, and he's so selfless, it's a sign of selflessness. How do I need to behave so that these people will understand what I have to give them and they'll understand the value of what I have to give them and they'll take it seriously. So that is humility. That is real humility. It doesn't matter whether you like to act a certain way or not, you will act in the way that will ultimately be in the best interest of everyone that you're dealing with. That is real humility. So it's a very, very deep level. We often have this kind of superficial humility in our, in our, in our community. Oh, oh, Prabhu, I'm, I'm so full, oh, Prabhu, I'm so full of, Prabhu, oh no, I'm so full of Prabhu. And, and the person's actually thinking, you know, did you notice how humble I am? Did you, did you, did you, did you catch that? I must be, you know, you know I'm advanced, don't you? You know I'm very, very humble, you know? And, if, and you, we want people to like us, but, but what's implicit is that with real humility, people may not even like you. If you're genuinely doing what's best for everyone, <laughs> sometimes people may not even agree with you, but you're so selfless, you're gonna do it anyway with the right mood and the right purpose. So it's a little bit sensitive also because it's now not an excuse to misbehave. It's the right thing done in the right way at the right time for the right purpose, four dimensions. And that requires some sensitivity. So anyway, this is the point. So this, this visiting Vrindavan, visiting Mayapur, the pure devotees are there, they reside there. They're the ones who are, who are burning up our karma. As we're releasing karma, they're also burning up the karmic burden, even in these holy places. And if you take that to its actual conclusion, it means the one, it, if we take it to its full conclusion, it means that the most important thing is to, is to respect and serve the pure devotees because they themselves are a, are a holy place. Okay. So we can just consider this for ourselves. How much do I make my environment 
a holy place, point number one. Point number two, how often do I go to visit these holy places? And when I go there, what do I do? These places can transform us if we take full advantage. Because I remember I was in Vrindavan once and um, I can't remember who it was, but one senior devotee, he was talking about how he was speaking to some of the residents in Vrindavan and he spoke to one young girl. He said, he said have you seen Krishna? It was, it was a Vraj, a Vraj Basi. And she said, oh, no, I've not, I've, I have not seen Krishna. And, um, and he said, um, and he said, Balaram, she said, yeah, Balaram, yes, I've seen him. Yeah, it's just not Krishna, you know? And she meant it, <laughs> she actually meant it. It's like, yeah, I've seen Balaram, I haven't seen Krishna. But that, that's what goes on. Of course, it requires that qualification to, to enter in. So what happens is when we are, when we are outside of the Dharm, we do our service. By doing our service, we please Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu because the service is to spread the glories of the Lord. By, by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu being pleased, then we gain entrance into Vrindavan. That's, that's the natural connection. Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Radha Krishna Nahi Anya. By, by, pleasing Krishna, by pleasing Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he will reveal himself as Radha and Krishna. We will gain entrance into Vrindavan. Um, let's go on. Yeah, the last one, number seven, with a view towards achieving the aforementioned purposes to publish and distribute periodicals, magazines, books, and other, other writings. I, didn't, I couldn't find, I didn't have time to look for the specific quote, but I can find it for you if you want. There's a letter that Prabhupada writes to Ridainanda Maharaj. And he says that by writing, what you read will become realized. And Prabhupada also gave instruction to devotees to everyday write. So that's our family business, Prabhupada says. So this point, publish and distribute periodicals, magazines, books, and other writings. There's a vast, there's a vast array of subject matter in our teachings. A vast array. And, and, and we have to be convinced that the world needs this teaching. I was going to share this with you. So I know one devotee, and they had this dream. And this in this dream, Prabhupada was crying. And he told there were three devotees in the dream. So this person was telling me recently. There were three devotees in the dream. So this person and two other devotees. And Prabhupada was crying, and he was telling the devotees, he said, put this knowledge in their hands. He said, they have to have this knowledge. So this understanding, and so then they told their spiritual master and their spiritual master confirmed, yes, take it seriously. Put this knowledge in their hands. They have to have this knowledge. So in whichever way that we are also able to convey, and that proper says with a view towards achieving the aforementioned purposes. So with a view towards achieving the previous six purposes of ISKCON, the seventh, is that we should publish and distribute periodicals, magazines, books, and other writings. So it could be, it could be a blog post, whatever it is. But this benefits both the, the person who receives the writing and the person who's doing the writing because we write for self-purification. In the writing, what are you doing? There's, there's studies on this as well. It's so amazing. What happens when you write you're also, you're also expressing yourself, but in the process, you're also impressing within yourself that same knowledge. You're deepening your own samskar of understanding about Krishna, your understanding about Krishna consciousness, your understanding about how Krishna consciousness relates to whatever dimension of life you're writing about. So it's also a process of transformation. It's also a process of purification. And you can develop a very deep connection to the teachings in this process of writing because it's also nididyasana. It's also a way of digesting the teachings. How would I apply this? How, would, how does this work? Whether it's in prayer, it's in prose, whatever it is, you're also transforming yourself in the process and benefiting, benefiting humanity by connecting with them and bringing them closer. So um, 
I was discussing this morning with one devotee and they, they were just sharing with me their, their study of, of the Bhagavatam. So they were talking about the second canto Bhagavatam. And so Shukadev Goswami in the assembly, so he's speaking to Pariksit Maharaj, but he knows that there are many other personalities in the assembly and they have different interests in different types of yoga. So what he does in his communication is he's speaking about various yoga processes and he'll conclude that of all these processes, bhakti yoga is the highest. And he'll also conclude, and this is in the earlier chapters of the second canto, how the, the benefits of all the other yoga processes are achieved in bhakti yoga in their perfect sense. So, so think about that as a process. You're connecting with people about different types of interests that they have. Look at it on the strategic level, the, the, the procedural level. These yogis, they're into different types of yoga. I'm speaking about the yogas they are into, and I'm showing them how all the things that you want in your yoga practice, you will get in bhakti yoga. And bhakti yoga is the highest form of all the yoga practices that, you, that you're doing. So you could take even that same template. You're writing about something that someone is interested in, ecology, relationships, whatever. And you're showing them how, yes, we understand that relationships are a natural part of human life. And, and all of this, the perfect understanding of this process or you know, relationship is when you have this relationship with the divine. You're taking them from where they are and giving them an invitation. We, we're not, we can't force anyone, but you're taking them from where they are and you're giving them an invitation towards Krishna very very powerful and in the process we are also transforming ourselves as well so you know I, some of you will know recently um so one of the biggest celebrities in the world will smith well-known celebrity movie star etc so his wife jada pinkett smith so she's been reading bhakti tita maraj's spiritual warrior 2 book transforming lust into love so, I mean, she has millions of followers on Instagram. So I think it was a few weekends ago, maybe two, three Sundays ago. So she put on her Instagram page. She was talking about the book and how the books really helped her to get together and so on. You know, so that literature has been written, again, in line with this instruction. Proper one of his disciples to write. And it's gone into the hands of someone who is very, very well known in society. And they've appreciated it. You know, I remember years ago reading the Jada Pinkett Smith, that family, they're into Kirtan. They've been into Kirtan for years, several years. And I saw it was a, it was a news, I think it was a newspaper article. They've been at some Kirtan event and there were these different Kirtanis. So she's been into this for some time, you know. And so Krishna, he will make all the arrangements. Krishna makes Krishna conscious and successful. But between his desire and the success is the devotee. Okay, Krishna's desire, Krishna's outcome, Krishna's devotee. The three different, three different factors, and he wants to give his devotee the credit. We can think like Arjuna on the battlefield. It's the same, it's exactly the same story. These people, they're dead. They're dead because I say that they're dead but I would like you to be the instrument of my own will. Okay, don't worry about the result. I will take care of the result. You just fight. So we can take it in a similar way in this seventh purpose. The world will be flooded with Krishna consciousness and people will take to it en masse. En masse. Even if you can't imagine how it can happen now, en masse. I'm going to give you one other thing which I've been thinking about. It just came to me, then we'll open up the questions. So the world will become Krishna conscious because Krishna is going to do it. He's God. He's all powerful. He can do anything. That's what it means to have faith. Faith means he can do anything. He can really do anything. And it's all his energy. He's in control. But someone should be the, someone should be the postman. Someone should be the messenger of his message. His message will do everything, but you should deliver the message. And you should deliver the message intact. And deliver the message, two things here. I'll just touch upon two things and I'll say one more, then we'll open up the question. It's the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. Okay? So there's the teaching and there's the mood of the teaching. It is easy to take any teaching out of context. 
It is easy to take a teaching and use it against someone, but that's not the spirit of the law. Everything Prabhupada said is said with compassion to elevate everyone. So you're meant to deliver the message and the mood of the message. That means what Prabhupada said and the application of what's been said. And it's meant to be, um, it's meant to be embodied in the example ideally. Because otherwise you have what you have in modern culture. There's a backlash against tradition because tradition's been misused in many cases. So people, unfortunately, they want to throw out the baby and the bathwater. Our thing is, yes, it's been misused, true. So use it properly. Deliver the message and the compassionate mood and purpose of the message. And then it's the full package. That's a real delivery. That's a real delivery. In, in line with this point about the, the, the fact that Krishna will spread the mission, I remember hearing years ago, Prabhupada, he wanted an airport in Mayapur so that people could come and fly straight in to the Holy Dham. Now, I've been going to Mayapur for at least 20 years. Now, if you, if you look at it 20 years at least ago, you could think, how is that going to be possible? Why would, the, why would the Indian government build an airport directly in Mayapur so that people can fly from around the world directly to Mayapur? So you could think, well, I don't see how that's going to happen. But Prabhupada wanted it. Now, we know that Krishna reciprocates with the desire of his pure devotee. So what's happening? Temple of Vedic Planetarium. Around that temple, all these businesses, hotels, all these things are going up because they're thinking, when this temple is completed, it will be a huge tourist attraction. People will fly in from virtually all over the world just to come and visit this particular temple, devotees and non-devotees, right? So you couldn't see how this is gonna happen, but now when that's established, what's gonna happen? Then the Indian government, they're gonna think, you know what? There'll be some people who are not coming to Mayapur because the infrastructure is not there. It's difficult to get there. You know what we should do? We should build an airport directly in Mayapur because if we build an airport directly in Mayapur, people will be able to fly in without obstruction. They're looking at it from the point of the economics. But what's happening is Krishna will be fulfilling the desire of his pure devotee. So it's often like that. It's often the case, you think, well, I don't see how this is gonna happen. Yeah, we may not see, but it's gonna happen. We may not see how it's gonna happen, but it's definitely gonna happen. Right? And, and Krishna likes, he, Krishna has a mischievous mood. He's got a sense of humor. He likes to also, he's, he's a bit playful. So this kind of like, yeah, I know you can't see how it's gonna happen. But we'll make it happen, don't worry. And, and we'll do it in style, don't worry. So this is, this is it, this is it. So these are some reflections on the seven purposes. Okay, and then maybe we can open up for questions. Maraj, obviously, please feel free to add anything, subtract anything, comment. Thank you so much, Bhutabhavana Prabhu. Chandramal Maharaj, would you like to add something? <laughs> I'm just going to add my appreciation for everything I heard, and I wrote a bunch of notes here, so I'm hoping to go back over it and see for how I can implement some of this stuff. But everything you said is, uh, a lot of it was, was seed, but in a lot of more of it was the seed blossoming in different ways. When you mentioned about the Holy Dams and the importance of going to the Holy Dams, it's, I found that a principle that needs to be emphasized because somehow because of the, for whatever reason, my monetary or time-wise, people don't go to the Holy Dams. And Prabhupada's instruction was that every devotee in the ISKCON society should visit Sri Dham Mayapur for eight days. He uses the word eight days during the Gorpurnima festival. <laughs> Uh, and, and the reason why is to bring all the devotees at part of that other bringing the devotees together in one family type atmosphere where we can learn about each other, meet each other and, and inspire each other in our different projects around the world. It's such, a, uh, such an important instruction. 
And Prabhupada extended that, that same principle in a most amazing way. It seems like an impossible way, the way he said it. He said, we should visit, each devotee should visit all of the holy places that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu visited when he was here. <laughs> That's in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. That means <laughs> like there's hundreds of places where Mahaprabhu went, especially on his tour in, in South India. And of course, in Bangladesh also. Uh, that's a statement. So the Prabhupada was, as, he, as you said, Prabhupada thought big. And if we could get half of them, that would be considered a, a great success. But Prabhupada was pushing Krishna consciousness through this principle of, you know, the Dhams. Because as soon, and I've seen it, and I've seen it over and over again, when someone who's been practicing Krishna consciousness for years finally goes to India, goes to the Dham, they come back and they say, now I understand Krishna consciousness. Now I'm inspired in my Krishna consciousness. Just by that visit, it, it takes someone from one level to an, a, a much higher level, simply by going to the Holy Dhams. And it's one of the, it's one of the regulative principles that we should follow very carefully. So... I just wanted to make that. Thank you so much, Mara, for illuminating us more. And there's so much more I would like to say. But unfortunately, I have a, an engagement that started 10 minutes ago. <laughs> so I'll be hopefully be able to hear the rest of the questions and answers on a recording. But thank you very much. And I offer my obeisances to you and all the devotees. Please continue. And devotees, uh, please ask questions because questions inspire discussions. And discussions reveal more and more of the things we need to hear and the things we need to apply in our life. It's so... One teacher, it's so important to ask questions because as soon as we ask questions, we open up so many more ideas on the same topics that may have not been discussed in the initial presentation. And it's always very helpful and inspiring. So please take time, and my Bhuta Bhavana is all ready to answer your questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Please excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm, if I don't go, I I might find myself in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you in our afternoon session. And uh, in the meantime, uh, we have a few questions that were sent on the chat uh, for Buddha Bhavana Prabhu. So the first question is. Uh, can you please elaborate on how serving the book and the person Bhagavad can take us to Nishta? Yeah, it just, so in the first few, there's in the first canto, there are a series of verses and they explain that it destroys everything troublesome to the heart. It's actually a verse, I can't remember the actual Sanskrit right now, but it's, it's stated there explicitly. So the point is that if, so the point is that the book Bhagavatam is actually Krishna. It's Krishna in the, in the form of a literature. It's Krishna in the form of a book. So the, the general principle that makes everything work in spiritual life is, is association. So when you study the Bhagavatam in the right mood, in a mood of service, because it's, a, because it's actually a deity, if he's pleased, he'll reveal stuff to you in the book. So Krishna himself asks the book, He'll, he'll reveal stuff to you and he'll also destroy the anatas. You know, so when you, when you serve, it's actually a service. It looks like, externally it looks like studying and reading, but you're actually doing service to the book. That's what you're actually doing. There you, thank you, Chandra Prabhu. You're doing service to the book. You actually should approach the Bhagavatam in the mood of service and with a mood of humility. If you do that and you do it regularly, because that's what it says, Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya, 
It's not once, it's not every now and then. If you do it regularly, then you actually, then you develop the relationship, you personalize the relationship. And then the book, well, Krishna, in the form of the book, he reveals things to you. And he also destroys the, in, the anatis within the heart. The same thing happens with the association of pure devotees or advanced devotees. Their association, as long, the key thing with the, both the book and the person, as long as you don't associate offensively, you'll always gain, right? But you won't necessarily be aware of what you gain because a lot happens on a very subtle level. Depending on how sensitive you are, you may pick up something, but even if you don't feel anything's happening, a lot's happening. A lot's happening. You can they literally, an artist can be destroyed. I mean, that's one thing. I remember one devotee, they were around a devotee and they could feel the shadow ecstasy. That's mentioned in Nectar of Devotion. So they were around this devotee and they could feel waves of ecstasy coming off the devotee's body. So all of these things can be, I mean, obviously that's because of the advanced association, but all of these things are real. All these things can be experienced through getting in, through instructions. We can get clarification about how we should, how we can progress in spiritual life. We can gain, you know, the blessings to become purified and we can gain clarification in terms of our understanding. We can gain clarification in terms of how we apply the teachings. We can deal with different problems that we have internally and externally, all of these things. So these are practical things. Of the two, actually, the person Bhagavad carries that, the Lord in the heart. You know, so definitely you should have a, if you can, because it's also a very dynamic way. The person Bhagavat is a dynamic expression of the mercy of the book Bhagavat. So both, you should go for both. So you should read Bhagavatam regularly so in a mood of service and you should serve advanced or pure devotees whenever the opportunity becomes available. And whether you know it or not, it will change you. It, it, what happens if you do that is opportunities come into your life. You may think that they were just coming anyway, but they're not. They're opportunities which are coming because of the blessings of those personalities. And they're ble they're, they bless you because they're pleased by your mood of service. It's not just your service. This is where we get it wrong. Devotees can do anything, but it's the mood of service because Krishna doesn't need anything. So what he's really relishing is your service mentality, you see? Otherwise you get into this kind of thing where whoever's done the, the biggest external thing, they're the best devotee. It's a, it's a symptom of Prakrita Bhaktas because Prakrita means material, materialistic devotees. So if I'm on the gross materialistic level, I, only, I can only judge things externally. Anyway, Bhakti Vinod Thakur also writes about that point, but we won't go into that. But that's the point. It's service to the book and person. The book by reading, the person, you serve them primarily by hearing in, the, in, the, in, the, in a genuine mood of devotion with a purpose of wanting to advance in spiritual life. And you also render service where you can. But even the hearing is a service. Be very clear on that. Hearing from very advanced devotees with the proper mood is a service. And through that hearing process in the proper mood, whatever they have to give, you can receive it. Yeah, that's how it works. Thank you so much for this wonderful uh, answer. There is, a, there is a second question also uh, from Radha Vinodini. She's writing, Hare Krishna, thank you for a nice class. I have a question about honest, deep relationship and friendships. When we are looking for this kind of associations, how to avoid those who spoil us, also not seeking in our character, which we don't want to see. Because if we cannot identify our faults, it's also difficult to notice when others also cannot identify them. Yeah, so no one can do it, the work for us. The first thing is, am I a good friend myself? Because like attracts like. If I've got a cheating mentality, I'm selfish, I, you know, I just want people to do what I want, I've got no genuine concern for them in their own right, I see them as, as an extension of myself, then that resonates through my own consciousness. And again, just like we talked about karma is an exercise in empathy, what's Krishna going to do? Okay, you're a very selfish devotee, you have no concern for anyone except yourself. Okay, we need to rectify that. Krishna's soft-hearted, so what happens first is he arranges for you to hear that that needs to change. 
right? This is this also relates to the question that was asked. He's very soft-hearted. He he can't he can't actually be harsh with devotees. So what he does is he'll send devotees. He'll send the teachings. So it's like basically, you know, maybe that's not the right mentality. Maybe you know maybe we should we should we should have more of a service mentality. He'll arrange for pe for you to hear that this should change. Now what happens is if the person continues to refuse to hear, then it becomes more intense the correction. Right. So then what can happen is then you can be on the receiving end of that behavior. So so then you again, you get that kind of ouch, that kind of, you know, putting your hand in the fire experience. And now what happens is you're experiencing what it's like to have to deal with someone who's like you, basically. You see. So. It goes through gradations. Generally, generally, I mean, there's a, there's a nuance according to karma. Sometimes you're behaving properly, but because of improper previous behavior, there's some repercussion that we have to deal with. Now, this is important to talk about here as well. But, but, but if you behave properly, you also elevate your consciousness and therefore you have the strength to deal with the reactions to your previous karma in such a way that it doesn't affect you more than it needs to. You see? So... The, the conclusion of it all is always deal with the devotees properly. And it starts with consciousness because Krishna can pick up what's going on in the mind. There are some devotees in their mind, they're offensive and they're kind of rude, but they don't speak it, <laughs> but they think it, right? So they, they, in their mind, they're kind of playing out, kind of just being harsh to people, shouting at people, being rude to people, but they don't speak it. But Krishna knows what you're thinking. So, they, so you, can get a, you can get some correction also because of your thought process as well. You see, it's not just like, you know, you, you have a bad mentality, but you don't say anything. So no one knows that you're thinking this, this way about other people. No, Krishna knows. So the first is myself, right? So the first is my own consciousness. Now with that, we talked about Swajati. See, you can't be blind. The scriptures is very clear. Different devotees are at different levels. So just as, let's say that, let's say for some of us, before we were devotees, you wouldn't just tell everyone everything about yourself. That would be considered foolish. You would get to know them. You get to know them over time and you get to, over time as you get to know them, you get to see, okay, yeah, this person, you know, friendly, trustworthy, et cetera. You get to know them, you build the relationship. And it's so interesting because we, even in the most sacred of relationships, which is with guru, we're not told, oh, he's a bona fide, he's a spiritual master, therefore you just take initiation. Even with the guru, it said you're meant to test him. And that's, and that, if we take it as, if we take it in the way that hopefully it should be, that's dealing with very qualified people. You're meant to test very qualified people before you agree to take initiation from that person. They're meant to be very qualified people and you're meant to test them. So then if that's how you're meant to deal with, with people who are supposed to be very qualified, it would definitely apply to others, to other devotees as well. It would definitely have to apply to the rank and file of devotees. So you get to know them. So if we, if we just blindly reveal our heart, it, it, and I don't mean you shouldn't, but you can reveal your heart about things to anyone and everyone, but if it's a very sensitive topic and you expect it to be kept in confidence and you, you're not sure whether this person can be confidential and you haven't really got to, to check that through interactions and you haven't made it clear, that's the other thing. We have different cultural conditioning. So sometimes also someone's gonna make a mistake and there, there's no bad intention. It's just that what you expected as normal due to your culture, your upbringing, your gender, your age, that may not be quote unquote normal to this other devotee who has a different background, different history, different upbringing, etc. So if we're not clear on that and we haven't clarified what we're expecting and then that something happens, we should also recognize, yeah, I have to understand I didn't actually ask. I didn't actually make it clear. I, I, I do want this to be kept between us for this reason, et cetera, et cetera. So first of all is my mentality. Am I a friend? Am I friendly? And then get to know the devotees, right? 
and you build the relationship over time through good association and through seeing how, how the person is. There's an example that's given in Spiritual Warrior 2 by Bhakti Tirtamaraj. He says, you can trust a thief in your own home as long as you lock away your valuables. Very interesting statement. You can trust a thief in your own home as long as you lock away your valuables. Meaning that like there's some devotees, they're wonderful, except when it comes to money. When money is involved, suddenly that, that kind of attachment comes out. And I, you, I can see people smiling on the call because you know what I'm talking about, right? You know what I'm talking about. They're wonderful. You can talk about Krishna Qatar, you can talk about, but don't do business with them, right? Because their attachment to money is such that unfortunately that will, it, that in that area they're weak and therefore that because of this attachment, they may act poorly. You, you, just, you just have to be honest. And honesty doesn't mean sentiment. Honesty means, yeah, I understand. They're like this and they're wonderful in this way. There's a bit of an attachment to money. So therefore, you know, we don't talk about money. We don't do business with them, but you know, but they're wonderful. And, and, and we should have that, that compassion because we're like that too. We all have some area of attachment, right? So it's not like, oh, they're bad, but why are they like this? Well, you, why are you like that, right? We have these attachments. We don't want to be like that, but it's not easy to let go of and it takes time to purify. So because it takes me time to purify my attachments, because it's not easy for me to let go of it, I have to also give other people credit. Yeah, they're called an attachment. Yeah, okay. But you know, it takes time to get rid of these attachments, right? And it's not easy to let go of. Let's give them some, you know, let's give them some credit. But we're not meant to be stupid. That, that's one thing I do stress. And Prabhupada says, yeah, the lion also has Krishna within the heart, right? He has a super soul within the heart. But you don't put your mouth in, the, you don't put your head in the lion's mouth. Because if you do that, that really isn't spiritual. And if, if something bad happens, it's not Prabhupada's fault. It's not that, oh, you know, these devotees, you know, the devotees, devotees are, you know, they're not like, you know, Prabhupada said they're not like, but the devotees aren't like that. Yeah, but no, it's just that one person. And you should have known that. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have told them that stuff. They, they're not qualified to, to get into business with. I had a very interesting realization at, well, I heard this, I heard this. I had what, two things. One was a realization I came to and the other was a statement that I heard. And I thought, wow, this is so interesting because it changed the way I saw devotees and it changed the way I saw our communities. Many of us, I'm sure many of us, if not all of you on the call, we've seen or we've heard statements such as, you know what, you know, sometimes the non-devotees act better than the devotees, right? You, I'm sure you've heard that time from time to time. And it's true, <laughs> it's true, there's no question about it. But there's, there's a subtle thing that we've also missed in that equation. See, it's true, first of all. But when we say that, and this is why we have to be careful, this is why the Bhagavatam and the reading and the hearing and the chanting is important. We have these samskars, we have these impressions unconsciously that we project into our lives. And we also project it onto the teachings, by the way. That's why we have to be purified. It's not, it's not just intelligence. We have to become purified. Now, what do I mean by this? When we say that, there's a subtle unconscious bias that goes along with that statement. When I say that the devotees, there's some non-devotees who act better than the devotees, what, what, what I'm often doing is I'm comparing a devotee in the mode of passion or ignorance with a non-devotee in the mode of goodness. When I'm making the comparison, oh, there's you know, some non-devotees act better than devotees, you're not comparing them to Prabhupada. You're not comparing them to Radhanath March. You're not comparing them to your spiritual master. You're comparing them to the devotee that you do not like. So it's not a like for like comparison. If you want to say that, then you should do it fairly. That means you compare the non-devotees in the mode of goodness to the devotees yes, in the mode of goodness. You compare the non-devotees, uh, you compare the non-devotees in the mode of passion to the devotees in the mode of passion. You compare the non-devotees in the mode of ignorance to the devotees in the mode of ignorance. That's a fair comparison. You don't compare the non-devotees in the mode of goodness to the devotees in the mode of ignorance and passion and say, oh, what's going on here? It's not a fair comparison, but it's unconscious. We're not aware of it. The second thing I want to share, and this was a class by my spiritual master, he made an interesting point. He said, you see, he said, we have to appreciate the devotees. 
he made the point that you may see a devotee that you don't like and they and who and who's behaving badly right we can't pretend that that's mode, that pretense is is a sign of the mode of ignorance when we're denying the truth but also seeing the truth and being harsh about it that's passion goodness is you know the truth you see the truth and you're compassionate about it and the compassion is towards the person who's behaving badly and the compassion is also towards yourself the compassion is meant to work simultaneously in both directions so they're behaving badly i'm i'm sad to see them damage their own spiritual life but they're also behaving badly and and i don't want to be on the on the receiving end of it so that's my compassion to me my compassion to them is if i can inspire them to behave better fine if i can do that compassion towards them my compassion towards me is yeah they're behaving badly i don't want to i'm not going to i don't want to be brought down by that behavior okay you see what happens is it's, it's always in one direction only. Either it's compassion towards other people, then you get burnt out and want to leave ISKCON. And then you want to write up, a, you know, you want to sell a website against, you know, ISKCON communities are, you know, are fake. It's, but no, just have compassion towards yourself. You don't have to be on the receiving end of that bad behavior. No one's asking you to be, to torture yourself because that person's behaving that way. It's two way compassion. But anyway, the other thing I was going to say, this other point came up in the class from my spiritual master. He said that, when you see the devotees and you sometimes think, yes, people who are not devotees, they behave better. He said, but for the non-devotees, if you took away all the things that they do as outlets for their energy, if you took that all away, you, will, you would often see a completely different behavior. What does, it, what does that mean? Let's say that someone is a nice guy, right? But he has, you know, he has these, you know, his affairs, he has his alcohol, you know, he's always watching movies because these are outlets for his passion. OK, now, as we've seen in the last 12 months, things can change in the world rapidly and, and unexpectedly. Let's say tomorrow technology went down. People could not access their movies on Netflix. They couldn't access their, you know, their, their, their YouTube videos, all of these things. They couldn't go down to the pub for, for they couldn't get their wine, their alcohol. For many people, if they didn't have access to all of these things, you would see a completely different side of them because these things are meant to help. Well, people use it. They're not good, but people use it to try and numb the fact that they're unhappy, you know. But if all those things are taken away, then you just have the naked level of consciousness of that individual. Now, you compare that to devotees. For many, for many devotees, they are, they've, they've given up so many of these external things. So you're dealing with the raw level of consciousness and they're having to try to purify that and often to try to purify that in association and to have to try to purify that in association while balancing all their material duties, which to be honest, often has not been arranged so well, which is also therefore the case that they're stressed. So if you look at it in that compassionate way, it's like, wow, they're trying to do something very, very difficult, right? And without all of those different outlets for their energies. So the heart can soften. Yeah, I, I don't agree with the behavior sometimes, but I understand what they're dealing with, how much they're trying to juggle. But it's, again, compassion with them, compassion towards them and ourselves. So therefore, we don't have to pull our head in the lion's mouth, but we do have to recognize that, okay, this is a reality. How do I compassionately respond? Thank you so much, Bhutabhana Prabhu, for such illuminated answer. Uh, we are coming actually very close to end. Uh, we have two more minutes and there is a few more questions, but uh, we are going to leave them uh, for the afternoon session because the afternoon session will uh, start in uh, one and a half hour. Uh, it will actually start at um, 3.30 p.m. Uh, UK time. So yeah. this is in one and a half hour. Uh, so we, at that time, we are going to have presentation about social media, IT services of uh, His Holiness Chandra Mauli Swami Maharaj uh, for an half an hour. And then after that, there will be an Ishta Goshti with uh, His Holiness Chandra Mauli Swami and His Grace Buddha Bhava Prabhu, consisting of uh, questions and answers. So please, everyone who has uh, questions, please use this wonderful opportunity to prepare yourself. 
and to be able to ask questions afterwards. We already have a few questions that are lined up. Um, so we are going to uh, also use that time afternoon to for the questions and answers. If you have some closing words with Bhavana Prabhu to say. Um, yes, yeah, so I guess we talked about this homework yesterday and I guess with the same, the same would apply to these other six points. Think about them in your own life, what you can do, and just share what your reflections are with someone else, because in sharing, it will go more deeply into your own consciousness. There's um, some neuro, anyway, I, won't, I won't bother talking about the neuroscience behind it, but it, it, it's transformative. It greatly increases the chances that you will also follow through on what you said because you've shared it with someone else. You've made yourself accountable in that way. So this is this is how I'm living with this particular principle and um, purpose of ISKCON. This is what I do. This is what I think I could do to improve and, and get feedback from people. Maybe your friends, family, they can give you other ideas that can also, you know, be exciting. Find something that do it in such a way that inspires you. That's I think that's a good thing to end on. Don't make ISKCON into or don't make Krishna consciousness into a drag. Don't make it into something that's like some kind of burden that you have to just struggle through every day. It is our responsibility to keep ourselves enlivened in spiritual life. So find a way to do it. Find a way to follow in a way that's inspiring for you, that keeps you inspired and enthusiastic, right? Whether it's projects, association, classes, don't be impersonal. Don't think you have to just pull up with anything and everything. Find those elements in spiritual life, in spiritual community that inspire you and do those. So do it properly follow do it but do it in the way that inspires you and don't think that what inspires you necessarily works for other people so do it do it in a way that works for you according to your situation in life your time space you know your capacity your character your interest and where you are on, on the journey from shraddha to prema okay i think that's all we'll see thank you so much for such a nice wrap up um, I'm very grateful to everything uh, that you have shared and for all of your experience and illumination. And also uh, thanks to all devotees who are present on uh, today's uh, uh, session with Buddha Bhavana Prabhu. So please uh, be back in one and a half hour. We are going to start again on the same link and prepare if you have any questions additionally. So thank you very much. And we will be ending now this session. Thanks.